My training is, is very traditional. Uh, intellectual history is maybe one of the most conservative uh, fields uh, in humanities with respect, or at least a lot of people working, working in it. Uh, my identity still is an intellectual historian. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was using, of course, everybody uses different kinds of uh, digital corpora these days. And what I realized is that a lot of the things that I was doing by hand at the time were such that, that could use uh, much, I mean, a better and more sensible ways, ways of going about. And actually what we are doing now uh, in my research group is a lot of that is based on what I was thinking when I was doing my doctoral thesis, which was traditional in, in a sense. Then when I was a postdoc, uh, I started actively looking for a kind of like a twin collaborator from data science. And I called one of my friends who is a medical doctor and asked that if he has somebody in his group that would like to work together with a, with a humanist. And that's how things went about. The short answer is that not all intellectual historians currently need uh, digital humanities, so you can carry on your work uh, just fine, probably without any new computational ways. Things will be different in, say, five, ten years, and, and that is something that especially the young people should take into into consideration. It is very important to realize that a lot of work that is being done now is based on digital resources and also different kinds of computational methods are entering the scene. But the method development for the sake of method development isn't within the interest of different communities, say intellectual historians. Whatever we are doing in the computational history uh, I'd like to always talk to the people who aren't interested about the methods. So if they accept the results, that they are better kind of results, or they're going in the direction that would definitely benefit their work without the question that methods are interesting or not, whether, whether the core is there so that the traditional fields go forward, then we are going where we want to go with digital humanities. I think that Clarin and together with other uh, European infrastructures in SSH field has been on the right path within the last, say, five years, where there's more effort being put on the questions of interoperability. So, and the real, what, what is really needed is that when we, and this is the big promise that Digital Humanities has been making, is that we can take a perspective that is much larger than just national scope. But still, for some reason, we are doing digital humanities or, or digital methods in book histories in France, Germany, Finland, Sweden, uh, so country by country. And, and the real promise in, in the, the whole digital humanities field is that we can broaden the scope. Take a, take a European perspective, but, but this is not easy in any sense. So, so the question, how, how can we compare data sets, how can we make things interoperable, uh, and, and how can we genuinely broaden the scope so that, the, that we're switching the perspective from the nationally delineated uh, view into a European or even global uh, aspect. Another thing that I'd like to add also is that uh, common Language resources are important. They're important for intellectual historians and linguists alike. But at the same time, I think still more effort could be put on the question of research data that is coming from the community of researchers. So, so thinking also from, from that, that perspective, a lot of these processes are uh, overlapping and iterative and so forth, but researchers are also building tools, harmonizing data sets, so how to facilitate that and take that forward, I think that's something where infrastructures like Clarin have a lot to offer. The real problem in humanities is that a lot of people work with big data sources, uh, but, but then the question of how to make that reproducible, where to, if you do tool development, how to, how to sustain that. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people feel like they're quite alone in these processes. So, you know, whatever, 
help that infrastructure can do when the roles are clear, so that the infrastructure is not there to make the tools ready for the for the researchers, but it is there to help the process. And the researchers in different fields need to take responsibility for their own kind of method development as well. So it can't always be that you just borrow them from elsewhere and you have ready ready made tools. If you need a automatic argument detection, then you probably need to be involved in developing that. And, and that's where also research, I mean, infrastructure support is needed. Before the people like me, we used to look at cloud, it's more than five years ago, we used to look, look at clouding and think, well, it's just a, it's for, for linguists to, to make some, you know, particular types of general tools that aren't very useful for us. But now, I mean, where, where things are going, uh, it's, you know, it, it is really dawning to a lot of people how these European research infrastructures are, are extremely important for us to go where we want to go. And, and, and the fact that, that the infrastructures are collaborating, so I think that that's, that's very important.